Good, yeah. I think you can start now. Go ahead and put on the live now. Radha, are you on live now? Radha, are you on live now? Okay, good. Make sure all the mics are mute. No echo. And try to pin. People are speaking, so at least we know who is speaking, okay? Good morning, all. Welcome to event uh, for IICT and also for the chemical community. On behalf of uh, CSR IICT, I welcome all the colleagues on the call today who are joined today on Zoom call and also who are watching us on the YouTube and also on the Facebook. Before I commence, I would like to uh, inform all the colleagues on the call today uh, the reason and the event for which we are all today on this platform. I'm happy to share with all of you that uh, Dr. Ravi Rama Rao, uh, the director of CSR IICT between uh, 1985 and 1995, and went on to become an entrepreneur and the leader in pharmaceutical uh, sciences, uh, was kind enough to uh, give a corpus donation to CSR IICT, where we instituted two awards. One which is called CSIR Technology Award, which is always conferred on a minute scientist or a technologist on the May 11th, and also two CSIR scientists, whom we generally confer on uh, on the birthday of Dr. Vidya uh, But this time we clubbed both the events together, and today we have these two young colleagues, uh, Chandra Valla and Anabasan, uh, as young scientist awardees, and of course uh, Sandeep Verma. Congratulations to all these three colleagues for being bestowed these uh, awards. Also, would like to thank the entire uh, family of Dr. Evi Ramarao, actually Chandra Ramarao and Ram Krishna, who always have been behind this award and uh, making sure that this event happens on time. So, my thanks to both uh, Chandra Ramarao and also Ram Krishna Ramarao. We all would love to have all of you physically in IIC Auditorium and enjoy this event. Uh, unfortunately, last time also we missed this event again. Uh, this time around February when uh, we were choosing the awardees, almost the pandemic was on low and Sandeep almost accepted to come physically. And we were making arrangement for Sandeep, but then I think uh, the peak has gone back unfortunately and then we had to make it uh, virtual. But I'm sure uh, very soon this pandemic will come down and we will have a physical meeting and uh, Sandeep and other two young scientists also would come to Hyderabad, spend time with us, interact with our colleagues, and also take the hospitality of Dr. Ramarao. Actually, Dr. Ramarao is uh, very fond of hosting a homemade biryani to all the visitors at uh, Amara campus. So, all of you are missing that uh, great biryani which Dr. Ramarao hosts to all of us. I hope uh, this is not too far and uh, we will have this event uh, very soon. I, on behalf of uh, the ICT family, welcome all of you and uh, enjoy the lecture of, of course, Sandeep and also those young colleagues. Uh, over to you, Chandra. Uh, Chandra May I request Dr. Ermi Sachinaragam to introduce the speaker, Professor uh, Verma, Professor Sandeep Verma. Dr. Ermi is. Good morning, Tom. Uh, Dr. Mirimi Ramarao, Professor uh, uh, former director of CSR ICT, owner of Lever Labs, as Dr. Jamshed has just said. And more importantly, he is a mentor to a generation of uh, scientific leaders, and many of them are returning in the chemical innovation space today. Dr. Sandeep Kurma, uh, Secretary of uh, Science and Engineering Research Board, PhD. Dr. Chandra Ramarao, Dr. Ramakrishna from Lever Labs. Uh, Below director Dr. Chandrasekhar himself and Dr. Chandrasekhar. The young awardees, distinguished guests and colleagues. And so it's a long introduction, a long citation for all of you. But then, uh, because you know, we are not physically able to see you, it's better that I talk about and make a mention of uh, those distinguished guests who are, who are now uh, witnessing this event. 
But as we all know, uh, today was the day, way back in 1998, when we proclaimed to the world that India is a nuclear state. And to commemorate the technological contributions of scientists and technologists of India and its technological prowess, May 11th is celebrated as a National Technology Day. We all know this. But uh, most of us perceive technological prowess as something you know to do with, uh, as advanced as sending a spaceship to the moon or Mars, or as gigantic as uh, you know a nuclear weapon that can destroy millions. Okay? But nature has its own way of correcting some of these. I'll not call them misconception, but then these perceptions. Okay? Because what it has actually shown to us is uh, that. Uh, Today, the technology to produce a small dose of vaccine as a deterrent to COVID-19 has become more significant than having a, a large nuclear de deterrent. Okay. So while the departments of atomic energy, space, defense do help us in providing defense, energy, and information security, what is not actually seen is that most of other institutions like uh, DST, DBT, DSIR through CSR and its labs, they try to you know, crowdsource innovations to provide uh, securities in, better, in several other forms, be it health security or human welfare security. So one of the foremost uh, in crowdsourcing uh, the innovation, reaching out every innovator, every researcher in the local corner of uh, India is you know a job very exemplary being done by the Science and Engineering Research Board of India, the DST. And this is where, you know, I think we need to make a mention of uh, Professor Sandeep uh, uh, Parma, who has, you know, taken up uh, this challenge in very, very difficult of times. Okay? At a time when it is not really possible to have you know, extended meetings with different researchers to decide, to de decide on, you know, what type of uh, 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 what type of uh, shape the future science should, should take for this. Without that, you know, is able to do it. Uh, the last uh, one year has always been, you know, uh, he has been working incognito, uh, but then they're working very effectively. And you see that if India has come out, uh, come out with challenges, and was able to come out with, uh, you know, combating these challenges, uh, I think one person behind it is definitely uh, Professor uh, Sandeep uh, uh, so, Professor Sandeep Parma, as you all know, uh, is uh, the Secretary of uh, Science and Engineering Research Board, but he has a very distinguished academic career, uh, which I think uh, many of us can only dream of. Uh, he holds a doctorate degree from the University of Illinois uh, in Chicago, and this is followed by you know, two postdoctoral stints the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. So both of them are, you know, more or less interdisciplinary in nature. One is in biochemistry and the other one is in the, in the molecular biology. This he was able to get it from John Hopkins Global School and John Hopkins Medical Institution, Battle. And in addition to that, he has also traveled to Germany, the most coveted institute there, the Max Planck Institute, and that, that's where he was also was able to get a, a post uh, doctoral uh, degree there. Okay. It is then that he joined uh, IACT, IACT, and stuff for technology, Kanpur, in 1999. And uh, he has several contributions, and many of them are very, very widely recognized. Uh, the Goel Prize in uh, 2019, which is a very recent uh, feather that he has added. But then uh, one of the most coveted uh, prizes in, in, in for Indian in Indian scientists, the Shanti Swaroop Patnaga Prize, he was able to get it in uh, uh, 20, 2010. Similarly, his uh, DASRC Outstanding Investigator Award, uh, Swarna Jayanti Fellowship in 2005, and BM Birla Science Prize in 2004. And uh, coming from the Benares University, the Benares Hindu University also felt it to felicitate him by uh, awarding the uh, Distinguished Alumnus Award from the Benares Hindu University. Okay. And uh, he's an elected fellow of all the uh, three academies. 
distinguished career and an outstanding researcher, uh, mainly when it comes to uh, cell and technical biology and uh, you know, the applied science. And no doubt that he is also on the editorial board of many of uh, these journals. Okay. So, presently, his uh, research interests include uh, programmable soft matter for uh, neuronal regeneration, a very upcoming area, bio inspired uh, nanomaterials. People have been talking about nanomatics and bio inspired nanomaterials quite some time, but then he has already advanced and then uh, mentored many, uh, many students. Novel anti antimicrobials and small uh, uh, molecular stem stem cell modification. So, the very, very brief introduction. Uh, I hand it over uh, to Professor uh, Sandeep Verma. And before that, maybe any, for any announcement, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Thank you. It's my honor to introduce you, Professor Sandeep. Thank you, NVS. And uh, Sandeep, again, yeah. hearty congratulations uh, for winning this year's A.V. Ramarao Technology Award. And over to you for the lecture. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Chandra. Thanks for the words of introduction, Dr. Satyanarayan. Uh, first, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Rama Rao, whose uh, vision has created this uh, recognition. And I'm very happy, deeply honored that I was chosen to present a uh, lecture today uh, as part of the celebration on National Technology Day. So with these words and felicitations to one and all, uh, I'd like to share my screen, and as we go along, I'll try to tell you the kind of work that we have been doing in the uh, past a few years or so. So is my uh, screen visible to everybody? Yes, indeed, yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, so let me start by again paying my due respect to Dr. Rama Rao. And actually, it's a, I mean, he's an iconic figure. Uh, I was not very close to the CSI system early on, as introduction was said that I started my career at IT Kanpur, but nobody nobody would have escaped the name of Dr. Rama Rao being such a, an iconic organic chemist and his contributions to pharmaceutical uh, products medicinal agents, I myself being a medicinal chemist, I have had the privilege of uh, following his work, his, his protocols, his synthesis, and of course his vision for some time. And this picture is being presented to Sir as part of my uh, regard, my respect to him. And it is taken from NOST meeting which Chandra and I had organized in 2018 as part of the 30th anniversary celebration of NOS. And Sir was present. He took time out to be with us and presented his views. And it was a great meeting. I think we, uh, we were able to interact with many new and old colleagues across and many who are part of this lecture today are uh, are present in this particular picture. And of course, uh, we also had a fun time where we were interacting with colleagues. And I think this picture would elicit memories to some of us uh, of NOS 2018. So with these few photographs, sir, uh, my, my deepest respect to you and thank you very, very much for choosing me for this particular recognition. Now I start my presentation, which is going to be you know, dedicated to this particular award, this award. And as it was pointed out, I belong to IIT Kanpur with affiliation to chemistry, biological sciences and bioengineering and center for nanoscience. And currently I'm in Delhi as a part of science and engineering research board. So this, this slide basically tells you what we work on at this moment. So if you go from the very left panel, and if you can follow my arrow, I'm showing you the structure of a protein and, 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 you know, and biological ensemble, basically, not really just a protein. And this particular uh, column shows you that our deep interest in chemistry related to biological systems, or you could call as chemical biology, where we synthesize small molecules, we try to probe uh, 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 biological systems. We try to tweak biological systems with our molecular design, and that is very, very uh, a sort of a, a flourishing area of research in my my group. The second picture is a picture of water droplets on a super hydrophobic uh, leaf surface. It could be a lotus leaf, and that 
tells you my other interest, which is structured surfaces for a particular application. So we make structured surfaces. We I'll show you one example of applied coloration, and you will perhaps try to appreciate. You will appreciate the the work that is being done in my lab in in terms of structured surfaces and coloration. And the final uh, column is of batteries. So we have been working on nucleic acid based batteries, and we have published several papers recently on high capacitive uh, materials, which are totally coming out from biological molecules or molecules of biological interest. And that sort of gives us hope that at some point of time, we may come up with uh, batteries and devices that are oriented or that are that owe their origin to biological molecules. And that is really a, a very different or orthogonally different area of research in my lab, but we, we follow it with much passion. So uh, let me start again by thanking my co-workers. Uh, my uh, current set of PhD students are listed here. And those guys who are highlighted in red have direct association to the work that I'm going to present. And a couple of them are here. Uh, Dr. Sudipta Mandal, faculty at NIT. Dr. Hilal Ahmed Pal, faculty at uh, University of Kashmir. And they have been also contributors to the work that I'll show. And of course, a lot, lot of credit goes to my collaborators who have been working with us over these years on these research problems and funding agencies who have been uh, very generously supporting our work in, in, in our research endeavors. So let me start with the first uh, topic that I wanted to touch. And of course, you will uh, pardon me for being a bit greedy because I wanted to squeeze three different topics uh, in this lecture because how often would I get chance to uh, present my work to Dr. Ramar also. You will perhaps overlook my, my greed and 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 we'll be I'll be able to convince you the kind of content that we have been developing. First one being chemical neuroscience, and here what we have been trying to do is that uh, to develop methods with which therapeutic neuromodulators such as nitric oxide or hydrogen sulfide, how they can be delivered inside the cell. And as some of you would know, or rather most of you would know that nitric oxide is a very simple molecule, but it has been shown that it's an excellent neuromodulator and a neuroprotective agent in our neuronal cells. It has its own say when it comes to signaling and regulation of neuronal growth. And of course, whatever else comes under the ambit of dendritic development within the neuronal cells is defined by nitric oxide. And I won't take too much time to go through the biosynthetic protocols, but suffice to know that if you start with, with, an, with, with amino acid L-arginine, through enzymatic conversion, one could release nit nitric oxide, and it can have several fate depending on how it is being used. It could lead to neurotoxicity, it could lead to neuroprotection, and if it, if it escapes out of the donor cell and reaches a certain target cell, through the activation of soluble guanylate cyclase, you can synthesize these second messengers, cyclic GMP. And of course, that would lead to a different story altogether of synaptic plasticity and smooth muscle relaxation. And that won't be part of what I'm going to talk to you today, but a very focused topic of how to deliver, how to deliver a gas inside the cell in measurable quantities so that you can follow its fate once it is generated. And I will take you back, of course, I uh, wouldn't have much time to talk about it, but this particular molecule, which is reflected here, had caught our attention where uh, aspirin was modified the way it is shown to create an organic nitrate, which, which when was presented inside cellular, in, inside the cell line, it released nitric oxide and a whole bunch of biological effects were studied subsequent to the release of nitric oxide. But I was, or we were rather enamored by the bomb, uh, by the modification of uh, aspirin. And that's what we followed in our molecular design where we took a dipeptide, which was uh, tryptophan. And this dipeptide was essentially to, to sort of uh, uh, cover these, these organic nitrates that, that were built around aspirin platform or salicylic acid platform, which are going to serve as nitric oxide trigger. So this dipeptide would, would give you a scaffold you would have organic nitrate, which eventually be nitric oxide release trigger. There would be assembly, there would be cellular thiols interacting with this whole ensemble to release s nitrosothiol through nitrite anion generation pathway, eventually leading to formation of nitric oxide. And this work was published a couple of years back. Uh, 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 we had reported in, in literature. 
So what, what we have surmised that nitrite release mechanism starting from the conjugate that is shown here is going to be triggered by, interact, by its interact in, interaction with glutathione. Right? So this particular molecule, peptide-based system, organic nitrate interacting with this particular thiol coming from endogenous glutathione, you would release nitrite ions. And that was assessed or, or, or that is already a known process which we got to assess through our through Greece assay. And here is a little bit of mechanism just to show you what exactly goes on. So if you have a thiol, if it inter interacts with organic nitrate the way it is shown here, you would form thionitrate, you would form nitrite anions, and that nitrite anion we were able to assess by the help of Greece assay. And what we found, although I'm not going to show you the traces, that we, we found generation of uh, a good amount of nitric, nitrite anion over a period of time. So we were sure that through the synthesis of nitrite ions or anions, we will be eventually reaching the synthesis of nitric oxide. So the idea was that how are we going to detect generation of nitric oxide inside the cell? Or is it is there a fluorescent assay that would allow us to measure the gas inside the cell? And of course, this is what we have done, that we, we took... Uh, 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 Neuro 2A uh, neuroblastoma cell line, we treated it with, the, with our molecule and at zero concentration or at 50 molar concentration through DAF assay and 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 a variety of you know experiments using facts analysis, we were able to show generation of fluorescence intensity or the intensity of uh, fluorescence rose up inside those neuronal cells, neuroblastoma cells, when we added our compound to it. So that was an indirect way of measuring that nitric oxide was being synthesized through nitrite anion pathway. And this particular fluorescence was available to us or was, it was available over a period of two days, as you would see. It had reached its maxima around 30 hours and it sort of played out or tapered off around two days. So, sub, uh, so uh, uh, a sustained release of nitric oxide happened. And what was most interesting is that we could we were able to connect the synthesis of nitric oxide with neuride growth. So what happens is that here is here are some some uh, uh, microscopy slides with new to a cell line. You would find that if you just use control for one day or two days, these neuronal cell lines, there is not much difference and the growth is bare minimum. They are at the basal levels of their growth. But when you challenge these cell lines with our compound for day one or day two at the concentration, which is shown here, 50 micromolar, if some of you can notice, a lot of hairy, hairy-like dendritic growth starts occurring from the, the cell body of these neuronal cells. So that told us that there is uh, uh, there is kick-starting, I mean, we are kick-starting a biological process that is allowing the growth of dendri uh, dendrites on the cell surface. And we were able to measure over two days period. And if you were to zoom in, if you were to zoom in, you would find that what I'm talking about. So this compound one at day one, compound two added at day two, you would find all these hairy, -like, hairy growth emanating from the cell surface. And that gave us an impression that there is protein overexpression if you were to connect the dots. And we were quite excited that not only our molecule is getting in, it is releasing nitrite anion. Nitrite anion is getting converted to nitric oxide gas. And only nitric oxide gas is able through so soluble guanylate cyclase pathway, kick-starting overexpression of proteins which are being reflected as part of the dendritic growth. So we did we did a lot of cell biology assay. I won't show you all of them, but one which I would like to point out is that we studied the effect of our molecule on the overexpression of actin filaments, and and that is directly related to the the effect or to the effect of these molecules on neuronal cyc cytoskeleton. So if you look at a neuronal stem what you would find is that it is covered with these circular structures, these ring-like structures around the axon of a neuron. And those circular ring-like structures are, are actin filaments. And these actin filaments are not only essential for polarity, cargo transport, but also for the neuride growth, which I showed you in the previous slide, these dendritic structures, which are coming from the, the cell surface. So we were able to 
to take it we were able to do an assay where we took we where we took uh, uh, a control uh, nitric oxide less control a molecule which would just release nitric oxide and our own molecule and using depi which is the nuclear stain and fitc phalidine which is going to stain actin filaments we were able to show and i would like you to just focus on this particular quadrant if you will that we wanted to we were able to show high fluorescence output in the cells that were treated with our compound over all other experiments control experiments so this was a very direct uh, proof that we were able to achieve what we had set out to do and we were also observing the due process of protein expression which is leading to neuronal growth and that was again cataloged in a publication a couple of years back i will quickly move to another gaseous molecule which is hydrogen sulfide it's a it's a gaseous mediator and involved in a variety of signaling pathways i won't go through the bio biosynthetic pathway which is shown here but suffice for us to know is that if you take homocysteine or if you take cysteine through enzymatic conversion you can synthesize synthesize hydrogen sulfide which has a number of biological activities right they can lead to synthesis of sulfate uh taurine which is a sulfonic acid based amino acids lot of biological activities and these particular biological activities are are reflected here that hydrogen sulfide is a scavenger of ros reactive oxygen species it ameliorates the degeneration of the uh, dopaminergic pathway in, in fact it increases the the amount of dopamine present in uh, parkinson disease model and of course a variety of biological activities for us it was important to know that it also potentiates the hippocampal system so with this challenge in mind we started synthesizing small molecules that would eventually present when they are presented to cells and if they are taken up they are going to release hydrogen sulfide gas in measurable quantities leading to biological activity so for this long story short i won't show you the the in vitro assays what we did with hydrogen sulfide but right away go to an animal model or a c elegans model which was chosen as a parkinson's disease model and it's a very interesting model because it's almost transparent you can study it well and unlike the billion neurons that we have in our body in our brain it only has 300 neurons so if you were to take a, a transgenic c elegans you could buy a parkinson's disease c elegans a model of c elegans and that could be used to study up regulation of dopaminergic pathway in the engineered mutant and we did this work in collaboration with csr cdri and here is the molecule of interest which is shown here again we are working around tryptophan and this 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 particular you know appendage is is going to be responsible for synthesis of hydrogen sulfide so we would use c elegans for dissecting the the ros function and we are relying on cytochrome p450 and other reductive enzyme that when they are presented with this particular functional group the rat liver microsomes or the p450 uh, enzymes which are present in the microsomal fraction is going to act upon this this particular functionality and release hydrogen sulfide which is going to also increase indirectly increase the amount of intracellular glutathione let me walk you through this particular trace which is uh, op50 is this the bacteria which is food for c elegans in one experiment we took the bacteria we added exogenous h2o2 so that the reactive oxygen species and its presence goes really dramatically up because you are presenting with extra h2o2 right and we took uh, all uh, many derivatives i won't show you all of them but if you just look at number 5 it was able to suppress the the h2o2 or the reactive oxygen species which were being synthesized inside c elegans in its presence so what we we came to a conclusion that the conversion of 5 to h2s is responsible for for suppression of reactive oxygen species which is shown in this particular trace now does it also increase amount of dopamine yes it does and what we have done is that we have taken close to 5000 c elegans which are transgenic nl5901 c elegans that is a parkinson's disease model and when they are fed when they are fed with our molecule what you would find is that only number 5 
the analog number five, which was suppressing the ROS species in the previous transparency, previous slide, is increasing the amount of dopamine levels, which has been determined by LCMS analysis after taking 5,000 worms, treating them well, and the, 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 the fraction that comes out of after, after disrupting the C. elegans model, they were fed to an LCMS, and we were able to quantify the amount of dopamine being synthesized because of the presence of our molecule. So here on y-axis, you have dopamine in nanogram per ml, and here you have uh, uh, OP50, which is the bacteria. And again, when it is mixed with number five and fed to C. elegans, that is the transgenic C. elegans, we were able to show increase in dopamine concentration. So this was a very nice, nice sort of a, a, a proof that we are able to synthesize H2S and we published it uh, uh, a year or so back in ChemCom. And that was uh, really nice. And we are trying now to take it further and see if it has if it has any effect on hippocampal poten potentiation and we shall report it, say, in future, right? So now I'm going to quickly tell you a, a bit about what we have done with stem cell engineering with small molecules. So just to give you a one minute primer on stem cells. So basically we are looking at these, these very specialized cells which have the ability not only to differentiate or not only to proliferate, but they can also differentiate and replace many other cell types. That is the property of stem cells. So if you look at one stem cell, it can just keep proliferating to, the, uh, to, pool, to a pool of stem cells or it can differentiate at any point of time under the, the influence of external modifiers to give you other type of cell types. And what we have used in our studies is uh, um, human mesenchymal cells, which we had isolated from human umbilical cords. And what we have, what we envisage is that if you use uh, uh, progenitor cells, which are in, in our case as mesenchymal stem cells. And if you were to treat it rightly, either you would get more of mesenchymal cells or you could get these, these uh, different cell types such as connective tissue cells, cartilages, fat cells, osteoblasts, and so on and so forth. So uh, this work is again revolving around small molecule stem cell interaction. And you may have seen or uh, some of you may have seen just just few days back, Nature Methods had reported a concoction of these four molecules, these four small molecules, which has been shown, which, which, which showed that they had a tremendous effect on the human pluripotent stem cells. So now work is moving in a direction that you can control the growth of pluripotent stem cells by bringing in the kind of molecules which are shown here. And this is the background of what we did do in our lab. And in, the, in particular, we are trying to look at stem cell biomechanics and how the change in stem cell fluidity can be corresponded to biological effect, right? So what, what, what happens is that stem cells or any cell, when they are flowing inside body fluid, they are always under a lot of tension, a lot of stress, and they also end, uh, or sort of encounter quite a bit of shear flow when they are flowing through smaller vessels or, or, or blood vessels or other vessels. And this, this has profound effect on their shape, on their, their uh, mechanical properties of these cells. And what we have done is that we have taken atomic force microscopy, which we use in our lab quite justifiably for cell, cell investigation, is that we bring in a cantilever we sort of try to make an indent and without going into the detail, this indentation or micro indentation through this force constant or, or, or force equation is used by us to determine how much change is happening is the, in the stress strain value, is the Young's modulus changing and we can do a whole lot of activities with this. You can put small molecules, measure the change in the fluidity of stem cells and that can be connected to biological properties. And here is one typical example of a very simple tripeptide, cysteine, alanine, glycine tripeptide. And you see the kind of force constants, force maps we generate in our lab with, with atomic force microscopy. And of course, without going into the detail, we sort of look at, you know, if, if you, when you indent, how quickly that indentation is going back to its, its original position. And that can be sort of uh, uh, traced back in the, in traces looking like this force versus indentation, you know, how how much you have gone inside in picometers, right? And we fit it with Hurst model. And what we found is this particular tripeptide 
was able to increase the fluid i mean increase the young's modulus the 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 the, the biomechanical property of stem cells human mesenchymal stem cells 2.5 fold and what we did is that we thought oh this is excellent now can this biophysical cue which is increase in young modulus be related to some kind of biological activity and out of all the activities that are possible which are shown here we wanted to see if tissue regeneration is possible It means if you have a wound if you create a wound artificial wound can you go back and 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 see that you are able to uh, you, uh, you are able to uh, uh, regenerate uh, regenerate these cells, these cells so we do a very standard scratch as assay and without going into the details i am sort of running uh, short on time we found that two different tripeptides were able to grow so here is the 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 wound right so here is the wound that you create in the in a petri dish and once you remove the wound which is which is here and and you let your molecule be in you see incredible growth or incredible proliferation of mesenchymal stem cells which tells us that we can use these small molecule tripeptides for tissue regeneration and again we had published this paper and we are doing much more in this direction and to move ahead with the with the of uh, uh, this is just to show you that we do not leave just at the site of you know tissue regeneration but we also check both for women tin and and alpha tubulin that what kind of protein overexpressions occurred and i won't go into the detail just to satisfy some of you that it is not just a force constant study but we have done a full cell biology along with force constant study to show you that indeed these molecules are able to enhance protein overexpression that is correlated to increase in young's modulus which is measured by force constant studies the final uh, few slides are on applied coloration and what i want to show you here is that that we can create surfaces when on which if white light or electromagnetic radiation would fall would give you a different kind of color and the coloration is not unnatural to us i mean it comes in natural shape and form we have known uh, it in morpho butterflies where how how the the structure of butterfly is able to give you colors we also know how how the colloidal assemblies how opal based systems how metal nanoparticles they all give you colors but but our system is slightly different what we thought is that if we can we create a structured surface with hydrophobic peptides and if these hydrophobic peptides have the size which is almost but equivalent to the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation and if we impinge light would be able to generate color so it's a very simple uh, uh, pentapeptide as you show here this paper just got published in uh, 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 published and here is the doi number given to you so this this pentapeptide the way it is shown under uh, under scanning electron microscopy would present you such kind of detailed structure morphologies and we try to to interact these detailed structure morphologies with with electromagnetic radiation with light and what we find is generation of beautiful rainbow colors and here is the chromaticity diagram of the pentapeptide i just shown you and it this work was done with the help of tel aviv university because iit kanpur still lacks certain you know microscopy that is required to fully investigate such type of phenomenon so here is the structure that comes out of these peptides like as there are two or multiple levels of topologies that are observed under scanning electron microscopy we could write iit kanpur we could write tel aviv university and visualized under transmission or reflectance by hand painting it on glass surfaces right so here is the again here is a, a, a just a diagram just to show you what we see under the microscopy but what hap, what is happening here what is giving us color is the me scattering me so there are two types of scatterings you may have heard of rayleigh scattering which shows us the colors in morning and evening but me scattering is also something similar to rayleigh scattering which is done by non ordered sphere so if you have a hierarchical control of many fold topologies you would find when electromagnetic radiation is impinging you would find formation of different colors because the 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 electromagnetic radiation is interacting with a hard sphere and once it impinges on the hard sphere it can either reflect or it can even get 
transmitted through and through, and that is what is me scattering. And through a number of experiments done on our system, we are confident that the light that we have observed is coming from me scattering. And we have done whole new physics around these peptides and electromagnetic radiation. And you, one would imagine that if you can create rainbow colors, a lot of lessons can be learned and a lot of properties can be modulated in future to, to, to take this work in a very different direction. So we are working on modifying topology, not only at two levels to modify color, but we are also modifying hydrophobicity. We are going to use me scattering phenomenon, just try to modulate the size in such a fashion that we can generate the right kind of colors for a longer period of time, where the, the surfaces, design surfaces are, 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 can be sort of printed on large areas. So we would, we would work on bottom of printing or of large scale surfaces. And of course, we are trying to put adhesives. We are trying to sort of 3D print it on different surfaces and incredible amount of opportunities open here in terms of material physics, in terms of chemistry, in terms of, you know, do a lot of surface analysis and, and applied coloration. And I, I would not show you, but one more work has recently appeared in Chemcom where we have used these uh, uh, new type of fluorescent dye to, to study latent fingerprints. So applied coloration, surface morphology is of interest to us. And I had told you about it before. And here is where uh, I would like to quickly wrap up my, my, or wrap up my quick lecture where I have covered quite a number of topics. References have been given to all interested to look up. And I'll always be available by email if you have questions uh, for me now or later on the work presented. And finally, I would like to profusely thank Dr. Rama Rao, sir, you are an icon, and I am proud to be associated with this name, with your name, with the, with, through this, this technology lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chandra, for your uh, uh, time and all who are listening to my lecture. Back to you, Chandra. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sandeep Verma. An outstanding talk, and uh, you really touched upon the nitric oxide which whole world is looking at as a miracle gas to get out of our uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, hopefully the company Sanitize also will take some cue from what you are presenting. And I also hope that uh, the paracetamol or aspirin drug or any steroidal drug with a nitrate uh, pen, hopefully would deliver nitric oxide to reduce the viral load and will save some lives. So hope we could uh, work together in this area and uh, make sure that nitric oxide is available to all of us. And again, congratulations uh, for this award lecture. And I know generally we don't have question session for award lectures, but uh, as you are a dear friend and uh, also there are colleagues, senior colleagues on the call, they would like to make any quick comment, one or two, uh, just by raising your hand or unmute yourself. And then we go to the next talk. So maybe just one or two, Max. So. And it's uh, Pradeep Pukan from Guwahati University. Hey, go ahead, yeah. 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 So, uh, go ahead, yeah. yeah, so you have used this uh, big uh, molecule nitride. Is it possible to use this for the same thing like tetra butyl ammonium nitride or small molecular nitrides for the same work? Why you should go for a big molecules? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We uh, There are people who are using other avenues, right? Okay. But what we find is that when you package it well with a ditryptophan dipeptide, the okay. half-life or the, the availability of nitric oxide can be seen over a period of 36 hours, okay. which is not true for, and this is single, single administration of 50 micromolar and studying it over a period of two days. So okay. that is one advantage. And of course, uh, you can think of many other advantages where packaging of such uh, functionalities or sort of covering it up with a scaffold would help the delivery uh, as well as uh, letting it sustain for a longer period of time. Thanks for your Thank question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bhugan. Thank you, Sandeep. I think uh, we, we stop here. And we have two young, bright colleagues. They also would like to show the power of organic chemistry, what they practice. And I request uh, Raji to conduct the proceedings for the Young Scientist Awardees. Raji, over to you. Yeah. Raji, I think you'd unmute and speak, yeah. 
very uh, good afternoon to all of us. Without uh, much uh, delay, I would like to invite uh, uh, first Dr. Chandra M. Bolla, uh, in uh, Agra Young Scientist Award 2020. And uh, just to uh, briefly introduce him, he did his uh, PhD in 2009 from Switzerland with Professor uh, Pierre Vogel and later in uh, two couple of postdocs uh, from Professor uh, Magnus Rupik group and uh, Professor John Blackwell group from uh, Germany and Sweden. And then he joined um, IIT Bombay in 2014 and uh, he promoted to Associate Professor in 2018. And he's, uh, Research interests are mainly uh, uh, functionalization, CH functionalization and uh, annulation reactions basically using organocatalysis and other metal catalysts. So to his credit, he also been awarded uh, INSA uh, medal for young scientist and also NASI young scientist award. Uh, and he, to his credit, so far more than 50 publications uh, published by from his work. With this brief uh, introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Chandra Valla uh, to deliver this uh, uh, lecture. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you, Dr. Vajrati, for the kind introduction. And good morning, all of you. Hope uh, all of you are staying safe. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Ramara, sir, for founding this. Uh, Avi Ramara Research Foundation to encourage the young researchers. I really feel blessed uh, for this opportunity to present in front of such a stalwart. I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar from IIC Hyderabad. So given the current situation in India, I'm sure all of you agree that the importance of chemistry is felt more than ever in this uh, regard. The contributions of IIC to Hyderabad are truly remarkable. So it makes me even more honored to have this recognition from IIC to Hyderabad. So thank you once again. So the last uh, six years at uh, IIT Bombay, our group is interested in developing new methodologies based on catalysis. So in this direction, we are looking at several uh, pathways like uh, CH activation reaction with a particular emphasis on cobalt catalysis. And uh, other uh, interests are like rhodium catalyzed activation of triazoles, photocatalytic activation with a visible light of small, small molecules and along with the copper catalysis. So today, I would like to show you our work in uh, cobalt catalysis heat activation reactions. So before going into details, you all know that the carbon and hydrogen are the fundamental constituents of all organic compounds. So they ex the CH bonds as a result exist from simple hydrocarbons to as complex as synthetic polymer. So while we have so many functional groups in organic chemistry, the CH bond, I believe, does not get, uh, did not get enough credit because um, its CH bond is represented as a, actually as an unfunctional group. Where we have many functional groups, the absence of any other functional group actually represents that a CH bond is the present. So this um, invisible nature actually even can seen from Kemdra. So even Kemdra does not recognize CH bonds. So this can be reflected from the ubiquitous presence of CH bonds and the lack of reactivity of these CH bonds. One has to address these issues to activate such CH bond for synthetic manipulation. So along with these issues, in the presence of a multiple CH bonds, one has to address also the selectivity, which will result in a complex mixture of regio product, regioisomeric products. So to address these important concerns, chemists have come up with a, an elegant solution of using a directing group that would bring the metal in close proximity to the CH bond. Now, the directing groups have been developed in such a way that you can reach a distal CH bond, which is of your choice, and let the metal do the facile CH activation, allow you to install the functional group at that particular position. So, while there are many uh, different directing groups in organic synthesis, I would like to show you one particular directing group. This is developed by Douglas in 2005 for a palladium catalyzed orthoaryllation. So, this is the atom of quiridine has been widely used because of its ability to coordinate and to stabilize the metal cycle with a wide variety of metals. Like uh, many other fields of catalysis, even CH activation is no exception and has been dominated by the heavyweight uh, champions like rhodium, ruthenium, and palladium. But with the increasing concerns about the sustainability, it forces us to eliminate these case materials, at least the materials which uh, pose significant uh, environmental challenge. So, which encourages us to focus more on the um, first row transmetals, which are uh, earth abundant and inexpensive. So, in this direction, we are looking at a first row transmetal like cobalt. 
In addition to the economic concern, economic advantages, cobalt also presents significant unique reactivities because of its um, alternative properties compared to its congeners like uh, rhodium and iridium. So, if you see a most accepted uh, CH equation catalytic cycle, it does have four fundamental steps like a CH equation, a migratory insertion with a unsaturated pi system, beta hydride elimination brings the metal in lower oxidation state, and uh, a finally an oxidation. The most of the focus has been on the CH equation and its um, different uh, substrate controlled site selectivity. But um, what about the migratory insertion? The typical uh, pi systems in these migratory insertion have been limited surprisingly to alkenes and alkynes because these are uh, commercially available and uh, easy to control the uh, migratory insertion across the pi system. What we were interested in is to use alien systems in place of these migratory, in, uh, in place of these uh, other pi systems. Of course, um, the use of aliens will generate a rapid complexity, but at the same time, it poses significant challenges. There are two orthogonal double bonds in alien, along with uh, two different patterns of migratory insertion, gives us a variety of uh, structural um, regio and stereochemical disparities, which one has to address. These uh, challenges need to be addressed before using the aliens in CH equation reactions. So here I would like to give you a simple example that uh, once you have a CH methylation happen, CH equation happen, it can actually insert, the coordination insertion can take between one, two double bond or two, three double bond of a one, one disulfide alien, which gives us to two different reactive intermediates, which we call m alkenyl and m pyrene. And the story gets more complicated because each of these intermediates is further capable of reacting in a variety of termination steps, like in this case, a, a protonation, in this case, a beta hydride elimination. The most common pathway for a pi -L -L species is to act as a suji style profile, and um, mostly the nucleophilic directing group makes an annulation reaction. So addressing these challenges before we start our chemistry in 2015, there were two interesting reports, one by Glorious and one by Shimming Ma. What they showed is that, indeed, this insertion pattern is actually governed by the presence of the different um, substituted on the alien. For example, Gloria showed that an RL alien passes through a path B, which is a pi -LL, And uh, I would like to draw your attention that finally the annulation happens at the nitrogen at the less directly hindered terminus. In contrast, Shingrinpa showed that the use of a TMS alien now alters the pathway to M alkyl, which is a path A, giving you this intermediate and further directs beta hydride elimination, giving you alienization. So this uh, dramatic reactivity of aliens is what fascinated us. And with the importance of a sustainable catalysis of using cobalt, we tried to explore in 2015 our very first um, attempt in CH activation reaction with aliens. So after a lot of attempts, it, um, experimentation, we found out that indeed one can use a commercially available cobalt two sorts, like cobalt attack, which is a which one can buy in one kilogram scale. This indeed does the CH activation at the ortho position of a benzamide, and the reaction proceeds through a cobalt sigma level pathway, which I showed in this orange box. Once the um, sigma the intermediate is formed, I would like to emphasize that how the nucleophilic directing group reacts at the most equally hindered terminus, giving you this most substituted isoquinolone derivatives. So this is in contrast to the rhodium, where people observe the reaction does happen, but at the less equally hindered terminus. Even more exciting for us was that the replacing the alien from an aryl alien to an electron withdrawing alien, we found that the path of the reactivity is even altered directly from sigma allyl to cobalt alkenyl. And uh, this cobalt alkenyl pathway gives you a 1 2 addition with the, ten, uh, the aryl is connected to terminal alkene, terminal of part of the alien, which will give you these um, isoquinolone derivatives of after 1 3 hydrogen shift. So we try to observe, um, understand this in more detail. So we did uh, several mechanical studies and other uh, studies. We believe that uh, in case of aryl alien, one could observe two different type of cobalt sigma aryl complex. While people typically understand the charge distribution is more when R is a aryl group that stabilizes the cobalt complex at the most substituted side. But I think in case of rhodium, due to its bigger size compared to cobalt, the reaction does happen through this cobalt sigma aryl where cobalt is, rhodium is present at the less strictly hindered terminus. And when we move, move, we move from R equal to Ri to the electron withdrawing group, now you know that there is two only things. The unsubstituted double bond becomes relatively more electron rich due to the presence of the electron withdrawing group on this alien, on this only thing. So in this case, we could um, we could uh, expect that uh, the aryl cobaltation can happen on this double bond. Again, there are two pathways. Either cobalt can go to central and aryl can go to central. While this pathway, we expect that uh, 
The allyl path, allyl uh, species, may not be stabilized by the electron withdrawal group, so cobalt directly alters the pathway and gives you an alkenyl species, and which in turn gives you this uh, divergent reactivity. So one final question we had is that, does the reaction E proceed through a sigma allyl complex, or a pi allyl complex with the reaction happening at the most strictly ended terminus? A simple experiment we come up to test this, um, this uh, issue was to replace the use of phenyl ele with a methylene cyclopropane that also has a phenyl group with a double bond. And if one could expect an insertion on this double bond, you'll have a cyclopropane derived metal complexes. If the a sigma pi sigma isomerization do take place, you would expect the ring opening to, to happen. But when we did this reaction, in fact, the methylene cyclopropane does react with the double bond and a reductive elimination that takes place faster than the ring opening gives us a spirocyclopropane derivative where the spirocyclopropane ring is retaining in the system. So this gave us a sufficient clue that really the insertion is going through cobalt sigma allyl intermediate. So moving on to the, uh, this reactivity of the elines, we were able to ex extend this reactivity from allyl sp2 to vinyl sp2. So in this case also, again, we saw that the reactivity is completely dependent on the, the substrate present on the eline. Whether allyl elines gives you these sigma allyl complex products like dihydropyridones, and whereas the use of phosphonyl eline or surprisingly the cyclohexyl eline gave us M cycloalkanyl product. So we have done uh, some interesting mechanistic studies, but I will not, not bother you with those studies. I would like to say that uh, during these studies, we, in fact, we were able to isolate a cobalt 3 octahedral complex with 18 electron in using a stoichiometric of amount of benzamide in relation to the cobalt catalyst, use of a potassium pyrimidine potassium sulfate. And we also try to isolate a stoichiometric cobalt and metal cycle complex. Indeed, we could isolate and characterize it by NMR and mass. So these informations give crucial information about the importance, important CH activation step. So moving on from these uh, CH activation of uh, benzamide derivatives, we try to explore its reactivity in uh, other pieces, other um, substrates and one thing particularly got our attention is the use of hydrogens having a two amino pyridine as a directing group. So this directing group allows us to use bidentate coordination which makes us to use cobalt two salts which are commercially available for CH activation. At the same time, the NL bond can act as an internal oxidant that obviates the need for any external oxidant. So makes the process um, more green and at the end also we'll end up with a this kind of um, isoprolylene derivative with the traceless directing group. So with this in, in idea in mind, we expected that uh, uh, these cobalt sigma allyl complex could be forming, which is a seven member. One would expect a reductive elimination, which is anticipated, which proceeds through a cobalt sigma allyl, which is electrophilic. But interestingly, what we observed that the reaction completely passed through in unexplored territory of cobalt sigma allyl complex, not much uh, explored at least, where the cobalt sigma allyl acts as a nucleophile, resulting in a nucleophilic annihilation with the attached imine. In this way, we end up with a 3 plus 2 annihilation leading to Indian derivatives having two stereo centers and with a high stereo control. So what we believe is that this uh, high stereo control in this product is a manifestation of a two important steps. First, the controlled migratory insertion of the eline, which takes place on the less substitute double bond, followed by the reactivity in intermolecularly in a rigid Zimmermann triangular type of transit, which controls the, both the stereo centers. Yeah. So, so one could see this uh, formation of a particular product by this um, diagram, because as I told you, the reaction does proceed through co um, uh, addition of the allyl cobaltation on the less substitute double bond. In here, we have two choices. The phase selectivity can happen on the top phase or from the bottom phase. By the top phase, there is a small steric hindrance which could uh, uh, inhibit the addition from the top phase, which will actually give you the trans cobalt species with respect to R. And from the bottom phase, you would expect the intermediate B, which is a cis cobalt species with respect to R. So what we observed that, yes, indeed, this proceeds through cis complex and the cobalt is connected to a carbon with blue dot. Okay. Once we have this LL complex with the R having a dependent imine, it proceeds through this rigid trans state. Now, the LL carbon reacts with the imine center, resulting in the high stereo control. So we indeed found that uh, this high stereo control uh, uh, can be uh, 
can be exemplified by different number of examples. And in all cases, we see quite a good uh, selectivity with a high diastole selectivity. And the conditions do happen at a uh, using air as the stoichiometric oxidant. So that also fits in our initial idea of avoiding the oxidants. So uh, I would like to emphasize on this particular substrate, which not only gives you two stereoselective centers, it also gives you additional information because now the reaction does happen with a N butyl leaving at the less sterical indirect with, with the exocyte means this position and the configuration of this N butyl also gives you two more additional advantages of controlling. So this is in line with the proposed uh, Zimmerman particular type of translate which we proposed earlier. So we could also expand this reactivity to show that methodology could be extend, um, applied to biologically relevant uh, epocyanin, aspirin, or menthol derived hydrogens. Although the yields are uh, in moderate in this case, still we were happy to see that. Yeah. So while I would I showed you this uh, different type of annotations which we have, which we are able to um, uh, illustrate. When we look at the literature, most reactions on C equation has been concentrated on these A type reactions, which are alkylations, alkanylation, alkylation, alkylation. But surprisingly, not much emphasis has been shown on the dienylation, which is even more surprising because these dienes are wonderful building blocks and can be used in deals order and other one for functional adjacent reactions. So with this uh, reactivity of elenes in mind, we want to develop a method that could convert these elenes into dienyl building blocks. So the simplest idea we came up with is like a use of a trans metal that will help us to do the CH activation with the help of dielectric group, gives you the metal cycle. Now, the controlled migratory insertion with the 1 2 double bond will give you these sigma alloy complex, the sigma alloy metal complex. Now, if one have a sufficient um, good leaving group as a X, you would, you would expect the elimination to take place faster than any other side reaction resulting in the dienation. So, this is our idea. In order to test this idea, we chose um, quinoline as a starting molecule because of its uh, importance in a lot of uh, medicinal chemistry. As you know, that there are seven different CH bonds in quinoline. There are several strategies to activate each of these CH bonds. And one strategy that caught our attention is that the oxidation of quinoline to anoxides in this way, the distant, of course, is not distant, the C8 hydrogen, which is a um, C, which could be selectively act activated in the presence of a more acidic C2 hydrogen because of the formation of a stable metal cycle of five-membered five metal cycle, which will finally allow us to do the functionalization of one which we are envisioning a selective dienylation. So here is a, a, um, our initial um, idea of using this quinoline oxides for dienylation. One needs to use, um, instead of the commercial available cobalt salts, a high valent cobalt-3 catalyst because now we does not have any more um, uh, bidentate coordination, but luckily cobalt-3 does activate monodentate directing groups. So after the CH activation, you will end up with uh, this cobalt cycle. If insertion takes place directly on this double bond, you will have a cobalt sigma L complex. Now, if depending on the Y, one could expect a protonation leading to olefination, or if Y is a leaving group, we can expect a beta elimination. So to conceive this idea, we initially started using the simplest of elenes, which are uh, cyclohexyl elenes, after some uh, optimization, in fact, we found that the reaction does proceed through alkylation. And please um, uh, look at the double bond. The double bond is in the exocyte, which tells us that the insertion do take place on the more substitute double bond. So, which is in line with our envisioned idea of dienylation. So, we try to explore uh, different aliens having a leaving group. The first uh, attempt was with uh, using a phenol ether. In this case, luckily. We were able to isolate a selective 26 percent of the product is a unsubstituted dienylation. So, to the best of our knowledge, the, use, the um, synthesis of installation of a, an unsubstituted diene by a CH activation by or any other method is not that straightforward. Of course, the yields are moderate, so one could play with the leaving group ability. So, one could play with the leaving group ability of the alien, and uh, as anticipated. With a more um, but better leaving group like a carbonate, we, ex we could uh, extend the yields up to 55 percentage. To further uh, increase the yields, we tested in additives, which gave us a, a pleasant surprise. So while uh, people could expect that silver salts do increase the reactivity of the cobalt catalyst, we found that the, you know, the fluoride salts has a crucial effect on this successful to achieve this uh, successful dienylation. The role of fluoride is a bit puzzling to us. And we tried to understand this role by doing some calculations. Of course, 
we are not experts of computational chemistry, but indeed it shed some light on the effect of fluoride. We found that uh, the migrate insertion has energy decreased by around 6 kilocalories with fluoride compared to without fluoride. So we need more studies to prove this point concrete, but nevertheless, this uh, optimized conditions of uh, deionization reaction selectively at C8 position allowed us to illustrate the scope of this transformation. We have illustrated all in all around 50 examples with the different substitutes on the quinine anoxide and uh, differently substituted uh, alines having a mono or di or tri substituted alines. We could even ex extend it to the benzoquinones or phenoxylinones. So, uh, so finally, this reaction we could um, have a have been conducted with a more elaborated um, alien, so alien derivatives having a menthol or cholesterol derivatives. And uh, as I told you, the C2 concentration of quinine anoxide is uh, much more explored. In this way, we did a tandem reaction of first being, doing a CH activation under palladium to catalysis, installing a C2 functionalized group, then followed by using a alien and standard conditions to install another diene dienization at the C8 position. So this also we could achieve, we could illustrate with the two, three examples. I am sorry for the missing of the yields here. Yeah, good. So um, finally, the main goal is to bring back this quinine and oxide back to the pyrrolines, which are uh, immensely more important. So this we could do in multiple ways. One way is to use a treatment of PCA3, which gives us uh, these uh, dienes in clean formation. Otherwise, when a two methyls have treated a quinine oxide, one could uh, use acetic anhydride, gives you quantitative yields of uh, the transposition of the acetic oxidation in the, to the methyl position simultaneously deoxygenation. And what particularly interesting to us is that this denitrogenated triazolation with the fossil triazoles. As I told you, we are also interested in triazole chemistry. So these reaction, a combination of anoxides with the triazole, do happen in a rapid five minutes it with a almost quantitative yield in most cases. So, so this allowed us to functionalize. We also have done some functionalization of the diene, like um, diels other reaction and reduction reactions. So in conclusion, the choice of the cobalt catalyst and the design of the alien led us to the illustrated divergent four plus two annulation reaction, or a three plus two diastasis selective annulation with a hydrogen derivative, and uh, more recently, a deionization protocol of the anoxides. So, of course, this would not have been possible without the uh, support of these young, uh, motivated uh, guys. So, I'm really thankful to all these people. And uh, today's talk, mostly the uh, animation work has been done by Arnab Deh, who just graduated uh, two weeks ago. And the idea of dynamization actually designed and developed by Rahul Shukla, who is also supposed to complete in a month. I'm also thankful to funding agencies, IIT Bombay, CRB, and DST. So, today, I am particularly fortunate that I could thank directly SCRB to Dr. Sandeep Verma for the generous support of these activities uh, in the last six years. So once again, I would like to thank uh, Ramara sir and uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar and thank you all of you. Stay safe. I'll be happy to take uh, any comments and questions. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture on metal catalyzer reactions of uh, Alice. So uh, I think we will go ahead with the next uh, lecture and any uh, comments or queries maybe I request uh, uh, write to Dr. Chandra by yes. email or other mode. Yes. With this uh, I invite now uh, the another awardee, Avra Young Scientist awardee, Dr. Anbarsan uh, from uh, IIT Madras. So he is presently working as an associate professor there and to just uh, introduce him, uh, he did PhD in 2007 from IAC Bangalore, uh, Professor Prasad and later he did uh, a couple of postdocs, uh, the first one with the Professor uh, Beller in Germany and then later Professor Dean Toste, uh, University of uh, California, Berkeley at USA. Then he joined IIT Madras in 2011. And since then, he is working on metal catalyzed uh, uh, novel methodologies uh, uh, towards uh, various uh, heterocyclic and carbocyclic compounds. So, to his credit, he also has been awarded various uh, awards. To name a few, uh, yeah, one uh, INSA medal uh, in scientist in 2015, and NASI in scientist award in 2016, and uh, last year he was also awarded a CRSA bronze medal, and also Swan JNT fellowship. Uh, 
and apart from many others. And uh, to his credit, he also have uh, 70 publications from his uh, work. With this uh, brief introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Anwar Sal to deliver his lecture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajreti. Am I audible? Yeah, little bit. Uh, can you? Yeah. Uh, is my screen is visible, right? Uh, let me start uh, thanking uh, Dr. Rajreti for a nice introduction and uh, Dr. Sivar Chandrasekhar and Dr. Ramarao for giving me this opportunity to uh, present our work on this special day. Uh, this day I chose to highlight uh, one particular topic which we have been working on uh, functionalization of an uh, ELIs derived from a metal carbis, which could be from a typical types of compounds are the trisol based chemistry which is an immune derivative which these are the two points which i like thought i will highlight today uh, just a as i'm sure all of you agree uh, that uh, nature has been an inspiration for most of us uh, both with respect to the complexity and the diversity which process uh, which the different kind of compound one uh, can see both respect to biology as well as, as you mentioned the complexity and since this of this molecule has been an uh, or the framework has been a uh, very key interest for more, many many de decades now and uh, although there are many approaches has been uh, known addressing this efficiently has uh, brought in uh, much challenge and one approach could uh, induce this sustainability for getting a high yield efficiency and uh, other factor which I highlighted here is the selectivity, which I, I always highlighted because once you get this selectivity uh, where you can control your reaction better, which could be in uh, chemo or VG or then HPA selectivity. In this uh, presentation, I like to highlight in some of the serious selective transformation which we have uh, taken up. And uh, when, when we can have this selectivity pretty high, I think most of this efficiency and then the yield of the transformation once increase, overall we can have a uh, very sustained approach for a construction of many of these uh, cyclic systems, for example. There are two points which we uh, always consider an important things to in our uh, chemistry. One is the use of transition metal because as already highlighted, the metals having a unique characters and they are bound to uh, possess and very different reactions. Uh, for a, even a similar substrate, for example, and uh, that brings a uh, uh, handle for a diverse reactivity uh, for a given substrate. And also to use a uh, reactive intermediate, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm going to highlight the use of carbon in our chemistry and how we are uh, able to control this reactivity to introduce a diverse reactivity and uh, something which is uh, not explored uh, before. So uh, to just give an, a glimpse of what is our uh, general approach is to uh, start from an, a single point starting material and to try to use a metal catalyst to uh, functionalize them to get into a serious selective construction of a carbon heterocycle system. Also try to uh, understand this mechanistic aspect, uh, which would uh, help us in further diversifying these applications and then uh, take it to a next level, for example. And uh, using these approaches, we want to make that the complex structures in a very possible uh, shorter approach, avoiding in all derivations possible. And for in this hand, uh, we choose uh, diso compound, diso carbonyl compound, which are like donor acceptor uh, carbenes uh, derivatives. Uh, as we all know, when you uh, either heat or shine a light, one would expect to generate a carbene precursors, which are quite reactive. And we can also generate an uh, metallocarbenes in presence of an uh, transition metals. And these two possess a uh, very similar. Uh, reactivity. However, the reaction of an carbenes as uh, pure carbenes, when you uh, think of, their selectivity could be very, very poor. For example, if you take a cyclohexene to do the reaction, one can expect a cyclopropanation and CH insertion, or it could be even an sp3 carbon at the allele equation or the other positions, or it could be even an sp2 CH uh, insertion, for example. So one would uh, potentially get a lot of uh, uh, products possible, which kind of gives you a power selectivity. Hence, We'll move on to uh, using a uh, metal-based carbenes where it is uh, reasonably stable. One can uh, 
kind of control its reactivity to give even very selective products. Uh, there are a lot of chemistry which has been already done. One can think of an atypical insertion, cyclopropanation, rearrangement reactions. Uh, what I'm interested today to highlight you on this elite chemistry, uh, these elides are based on uh, using an, a Lewis base. It could be, an, in this case, and I have what shown here like an a kind of an immune or an ketone kind of things, uh, one can generate an, uh, an elides which can further functionalize it. Right? The traditionally what was known is based on this substitutions which is present in this particular uh, Lewis basis, one can think of an a pericyclic reaction, a rearrangement reaction to construct an quaternary carbons, which are otherwise very difficult to uh, construct them. And one can also think of an cycloaddition reactions to uh, get them and uh, reach your cell in uh, serious selectivity and, and heterocyclic systems, for example, based on the uh, X, for example, it could be an alkyl based or uh, sulfur based and iron based heterocyclic systems. All of them are all of them are possible. Okay, so the recent approach for uh, this kind of chemistry, because these are something which even today are available in the textbooks. So what has been happening the uh, few days, few decades back, uh, is that people try to trap this form, the ELIs, uh, not from an uh, typical uh, ethers or an aldehyde or carbon derivatives, uh, from an alcohol or an amines, for example. The formed elides has this carbon metal bond, uh, which is basically an, uh, could be an act as a nucleophile. Uh, one would try to trap this formed elide with an uh, an double bond, which are like a polarized one, so that because this is not reactive, uh, one can also think of a rapid proton migration. So it's a poor reactivity has to be compensated by and bringing up an, an coupling partner, which is more reactive. So in that note, most, mostly what is done is use of ketones and imines and uh, kind of systems have been uh, studied for this reaction to trap this uh, you form the light to have an, an one to die functionalized product. Okay, so this that followed by protonation, one can get an uh, one to die structural product provided this reaction, the trapping works very selectively, one can even get a, a very regional uh, uh, serious selective uh, thanks and mission to uh, this uh, amine or uh, one to die amine or amino alcohol derivatives, for example. So, uh, and the, at that time, what we were thinking was why to use in polar double bonds? Can we use an, a simple non polar and alkenes? So, if we can use an alkenes under a similar kind of reaction, if it does happen, one would end up getting a one second one to die function light, and followed by what you generate is an all carbon quaternary printer with an alcohol and amine moieties in this particular case. But there are challenges. What are the challenges? As I already mentioned, the poor reactivity of this uh, elite, what is formed, has to be compensated by something which is an, uh, a very reactive uh, yeah, profile, for example. In this case, what we are using, we are planning to use is an alkane. So uh, that if the reaction is not uh, good, as I mentioned, one can think of a proton transfer to get one and simple insertion type product possible. So which means we have to kind of overcome the side reactions, what is possible, and drive towards this and increase the reactivity with an alkene to get an, an product <coughs> product of an, uh, sorry, product of an one to die functionalized one, which is like this. So to uh, get this reactivity, the one thing which we thought was the close proximity, uh, instead of looking at a three component reaction, we are looking at a two component reaction where the uh, nucleophile and the electrophiles are uh, placed close by. So this nucleophile in this case, what we choose was an amine, amine derivative, aniline derivative in this case, uh, and you have a close proximity you place an olefin. And uh, once you elide which is formed here, one can think of this reaction of the olefin to give you either indoline based derivative or a dihydroquinoline based derivative. Okay, so the, we thought that bringing an uh, alkene and then the elides close by, one would expect in this reaction to happen. And the second point which we thought was because we are now we are looking at a reaction of an, an alkene uh, to be taking place and what kind of transition metal to choose for this particular transformation. So on that note, we chose palladium because of a hectype reaction, which is well explored today and even received a Nobel Prize. Uh, so we chose that if the carbon palladium bond forms and they, during the elite generation, and that can potentially undergo a hectype reaction, or uh, can the carbon palladium bond uh, can uh, insert in an alkene to give you an either of this particular product based on an, a different type of mode, either an exotric or an endotric cyclization, although an exotric could be a more favorable one. So with this thought in mind, we uh, we synthesized the various and uh, 
anil in orthovinyl anil in derivatives and tested them under the palladium chemistry and we screened various uh, things and we found that uh, when you have an either free amine or an reasonably acidic uh, sulfonyl or amide based ones were not giving the product at all uh, even with an n benzyl derivatives the substituted benzyl derivatives the reaction was not working because what we saw found was we saw a very rapid decomposition of n when you just mix it you see a very rapid decomposition of diiso compound in shit uh, if you add slowly this diiso compound what we found was we found only this an indoline derivative we were not uh, Uh, able to see any and six endotic cyclization to and and i had to uh, quinoline derivative for example in some cases we even observed a simple insertion product as we hypothesized we also tested this under the other typical uh, metal chemistry uh, sorry, carbon chemistry catalyst like in rhodium 2 rhodium 3 copper 2 and copper 1 and all of them did not afford us in any reaction instead what we uh, found was and only this insertion product was observed as a major one Okay. so that kind of uh, as a, a first initial point to say that yes now we could uh, kind of react an alkene with an elite what is uh, formed to make a really a long story short i'll just give you an uh, what was eventually found was that you take this particular uh, uh, aniline derivative orthovinyl aniline derivative in the toluene and slowly introduce a diiso compound and in presence of a palladium catalyst you can generate uh, this particular uh, indoline derivative with a specific uh, stereo selectivity in a very high yield so there are few points which i like to highlight in this particular case as i said uh, this is a single diastomer we uh, been confirmed by both nmr as well as hplc uh, techniques uh, to say that we are not observing any other diastomer in this particular case and then uh, you have an uh, very good atom and stake capital economy in this particular process if you really want the construction of typical synthetic route it is not going to be very easy but we are able to do this and then and just in one step in addition our aim was to test this uh, trapping of an elide with an uh, typical alkene is in successful one you know we also could generate a uh, two consecutive coordinate centers uh, next to each other in a very efficient manner uh, remember uh, that these two phenyl groups are in cisson relation which was uh, rather difficult uh, at that point to and explain why and but i'll come back to that uh, little in couple of slides in addition to doing a very small scale uh, chemistry we were also able to do it in a gram scale this reaction and then show that this just not uh, restricted to an uh, you know the amount of uh, starting with the use but one could still get this reaction successful at even gram scale kind of chemistry there are a lot of example we have showed uh, that this reaction works beautifully and we can even go from an uh, simple ri substitute to vinyl alkyl and all that even a tri substitute derivatives also we were able to synthesize it and uh, the stereochemistry of this uh, the form of the product was confirmed by one of the crystal structure which we uh, isolated and uh, based on that we found also that two phenyl groups are a cis in relation okay so it's always nice to see that the what you hypothesis works better yes overall the outcome is good what you thought were and it really happened in the flask and but we should also what second question and then see whether it is really went to the same way what we thought right then we uh, went back and then wrote a couple of possibilities to see and how does this reaction works and one uh, what was our initial hypothesis was that you have a carbon palladium bond and then you can think of a heck type reaction through an 5 exotric mode and you can get to this particular uh, uh, stereochemistry and then resulting to proto demetallization can give you a product of course is very congested to put in the model to explain or convince ourselves that this and why this is giving you only one selective product for example and alternatively we can also think of uh, pushing this palladium from a carbon to an oxygen where now you see and it's a 1 2 3 and 4 with the palladium and you have a four atom unit and then you have also have a two atom unit it you can think of a metallo ene type reaction and uh, like an a char like tangent state one can if you put it together and uh, we'll see that because of this fine bond ring uh, is placed has to be placed in cis in relation always put this to substitution in a pseudo axial and pseudo equatorial orientation are uh, resulting to an a uh, similar kind of intermediate followed by the uh, uh, proto demetallization can generate you an expected product right but you have now uh, opened up on more option but we wanted to see how does this really work 
we try to uh, you know experimentally try to uh, conform or uh, isolate some of these intermediate in most of the cases we fail and we even uh, took an inserted product to study and in that cases also we could not get an and pinpoint information and see whether really going through an hey car and and metloin type reaction and then we took a help of uh, dr subramanian from uh, csar clri uh, to understand this chemistry and then he has done a dft for us as once again i'm not an expert in this but what we like to uh, take it from here is that uh, it seems that going from an uh, palladium or from carbon to migration to oxygen followed by a metal leaving reaction as uh, seems to be more favorable one to give you an, an indolin based derivative and important point to note here is because as i mentioned you have this fiber ring has to be always cis in relation in a pseudo axial pseudo equatorial and both in a boat like or a char like transition state what you see uh, it places these two phenyl group always in cis in relation that's the reason why we got an uh, selectivity a uh, very very high uh, for our reaction for example So this was the first time uh, we showed that one can uh, use an alkene in place of an uh, typical uh, carbonyl compounds and uh, imines or derivatives. One can use an alkene to trap this form the elides to get the chemistry done. And next we looked at an uh, can we make an instead of a simple uh, substitute derivative, can we make an a spiro compound using an a diso compound which is derived from a cyclic system, for example. And if that works. uh we can get an uh, at the c2 position we can have a spiro system in it so for that node we used an isartin based iso compound we treated that under similar reaction condition with the palladium we found that the reaction does work very efficiently and resulting uh, result uh, what you see here is that the even the selectivity uh, remain the same and uh, it also give us an uh, only one uh, stereo isomer a diastereomer and with a uh, very high yield and then we showed that the reaction works as good as and the ones which we have seen before one second we can and explain that through one and palladium uh, involved metloin type in molecular uh, metloin cyclization for example one uh, surprising thing which we noticed during this optimization is that under this reaction condition when we tested uh, even a rhodium chemistry was working better and interestingly that reaction even works at the room temperature and and the similar uh, isartin based iso compound and ortho vinyl derivative we got an and same pyro uh, substituted versions in an uh, good yields actually if you increase to one two equivalence of this iso compound we can even get a close to 80 plus uh, yields so then we looked at why how come this chemistry does work if you see uh, the palladium as you know Uh, it is easy that based on the uh, kind of pathways we propose that we can understand that one can have a palladium can interact with an alkene and then do all these kind of an migration spot uh, intermolecular cyclation possible but with rhodium 2 it may not be very easy because you have this uh, structure which is does not allow this alkene to come back and then interact so that may not be a very uh, uh, easy approach to explain this particular chemistry and uh, instead but one can also think of uh, losing the metal and then protonating for example to have a kind of an and driving force could be an uh, typically an indole formation and then have this particular oh and followed by an oxa this is because you have an uh, one oxygen atom in between as for gene type reaction once again can drive uh, this chemistry to give you a product and interestingly this chemistry does work at the room temperature and uh, we can uh, study many of this reaction what we tested for this a palladium based chemistry does work here and even uh, better and some of them which we are uh, unsuccessful with the palladium chemistry because you are heating at 120 and at times that we do see an uh, quite rapid decomposition of diiso compounds uh, are uh, compatible at this particular reaction condition at room temperature uh, with the rhodium uh, catalyst even then and uh, some cases where the yield was low at room temperature can be uh, yield can be raised by going to a little higher temperature to 60 degree for example so this opened up an a little more uh, thoughts in our uh, things and then showed yes this one can think of just not a typical iso compound uh, something which can uh, form this kind of an uh, enol or enamine derivatives and we can go to an uh, something of a similar products possible that means now we have had an oxygen we wanted to put a nitrogen there so there is other chemistry which i already mentioned like in addition to alpha diiso carbonyl compound we were also interested in uh, using an and corresponding nitrogen analog although it looks like a one atom change but there is a lot of challenges in this uh, but there was a chemistry which is already developed uh, to show that the n sulfonyl substituted triazole uh, can open up 
to go back to an uh, inner reaction mixture so that means you know not to use an iso compound you need not to add this in a slow uh, rate and we can just mix it under the reaction condition this isol undergoes and ring opening isomerism to give an a diisoimmune and the beauty of this diisoimmune is that once you trip that trap them with an a metal one can generate this carbonate uh, which can do a number of reactions based on the kind of atoms which is involved in the reaction for example if it is a, uh, if you look at an carbonate uh, so they have an carbon carbon nitrogen either you can think of an type 1 where only a carbon carbon reacts a type 2 uh, both the atoms of uh, this carbons and a type 3 you can think of a carbon carbon nitrogen so one can plan this chemistry uh, with an appropriate coupling con uh, partners one can diversify this reaction very efficiently we did that but just to summarize uh, uh, we did that this uh, a lot of chemistry with this triazol and showed an a typical uh, one one type an insertion reaction annulation reactions of an uh, various things what we have shown a uh, one interesting thing which we observed with this an electron rich uh, aniline uh, that we one can have this enamine derivative selectively form so keeping that uh, the previous aninal formation and this enamine and we were we wanted to stress this with an orthovanillin like an carbonylative uh, cyclation and uh, use of triazol in place of an uh, typical diazo compound with an rhodium catalyst we were able to show that the reaction does work and once again it's very very high uh, stereo selective transformation and the giving as and both the phenyl groups one second is in relation of course and here we were uh, even uh, easier to confirm uh, through an, an noe experiment between the cimin proton and the methyl group to show that yes these two are cis in relation for example Once again, we can explain this by a formation of an an enamide, which guys, this is what R three could be in this case as a sulfonyl moiety will be existing more in an enamide form, and that undergoing an an metal or yes, sorry, yes, iron type cyclization can give you this product, and this was further uh, you know taken to a higher analog of the cyclocycle system through a reduction cyclation, for example. Okay, so till now we have I have projected that and kind of different types of diazo compounds one can use and how we uh, got this chemistry done and uh, we also next looked at uh, can we go from an a typical diazo compound to its a precursor for example uh, which which lacks this ester moiety or an, an other handle in this particular case where you will not able to do this particular uh, metal ion type reactions when we tried with an and hydrazol derivative with one can in terms of base one can generate a carbonyl reaction mixture and a similar uh, with an orthovanyl alanine uh, we got this uh, quinoline derivative we were able to isolate this imine in the process and to show that uh, this undergoes an electrocyclic ring closure followed by oxidation uh, giving that and uh, we also tested this with an isoelectronic isocyanide and uh, under similar reaction we also got an and two amino quinoline derivatives also possible put extending that into one the precursor of a different iso compound that is electronic uh, carbon derivatives for example uh, before concluding i likes to highlight this particular work where uh, moving from an aniline derivative at the more challenging although it does look one second uh, you are going from a nitrogen to oxygen single atom change and we wanted to see the reaction works and you tried with the both the palladium and the rhodium and what we found was the reaction was not working the possibly because of the poor stability of oxygen uh, elides oxygen is more electron withdrawing and the corresponding elides may not be very stable to uh, really take the an alkene and further reaction for example to get this successful we went back uh, to activate this alkene so that we will be able to uh, get this functionalized product for example under that situation where we put an, an electron withdrawing group on this alkene so that makes this like an, an enone and it's more reactive now and in presence of an palladium chemistry for example we still got this and a substitute derivative of this type a uh, dry substitute uh, benzofuran uh, dihydrobenzofuran derivative and a very good uh, yield when you don't have any additive the yield was somewhere 36% and it needs an acid uh, to promote this particular ketone Uh, activation further, for example, and we got with the methyl sulfonic acid at 30 mole percent and 91 percent yield of this particular uh, derivative in a highly uh, stereo selective manner. Of course, uh, we did show that this reaction works, uh, you know, with a lot of functional containing uh, diazo compound as well as an an enone derivative derived from phenols, and we also taken that into one synthesis of dibenzo furan derivatives, for example. so in addition to that things what i presented today uh, of using an uh, elides and how we functionalize them to, to get into an a serious selective uh, 
uh, construction of this nitrogen and oxygen based hetero cycle. We do uh, work on this uh, uh, trifluoromethyl thiolation and functionalization of NCH bond very specifically uh, to cyanation and uh, even to control this, uh, I mean, chemo selectivity, for example, in this case, uh, as well as uh, what more majorly what we are interested in is this carbon based chemistry and we'll try to apply some of these into synthesis of a natural product. Of course, this was not, uh, it's not possible to present all these uh, without the, you know, constant effort of my, many of my students uh, who started, this chemistry was started by uh, Dr. Yadigiri, followed up by and Rajshekar and uh, Reddy, and currently been continued by uh, Rupa and Mageshwar Reddy. And uh, I also thank other students who uh, shape our group uh, well and then uh, keeps us motivated for uh, many years. And also the funding agency for generous support and uh, once again, I thank uh, uh, CSRI CT and the A.V. Ramarao Research Foundation for uh, choosing me this for our, this award and giving an opportunity to highlight our work in this uh, uh, excellent forum. Uh, thank you uh, for the questions hearing. I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions. Um, thank you, Professor Ramarao. Uh, Unbarsan uh, for an interesting uh, lecture on metal catalyzed reactions of diazo compounds. So with this, uh, the Young Scientist Award lecture session is uh, over. Now I uh, request uh, our director uh, for the presentation of the awards and others. Thanks, Raji, uh, for conducting our Young Scientist session. And uh, again, compliments to both the young colleagues for making excellent uh, presentations. And now we have the most pleasant part of the event, which is, of course, award ceremony. Unfortunately, again, I think uh, we have no podium, no invitation on the stage. But I request uh, um, Professor Sandeep to turn on your camera, Sandeep, hopefully. And maybe we'll try to highlight you. Yeah, his video is already on. Yeah. on. I can't see you. I can see Kaliyapan now. <laughs> Because I am speaking. Whoever speaks, therefore, <laughs> video will okay. come. Okay. Can you see me now? Now, yes, Sandeep. Okay, good. I think you keep speaking, so <laughs> <laughs> then you will be on the call. Yeah, Raji, I think uh, you have a small memento to be shown to all the audience, including Dr. Amarav and Sandeep. So, on behalf of ISCT and Abra Foundation and Abra Lab, Sandeep, congratulations again. Thank a you. bouquet for you, a memento for you, Thank and you. Uh, the cash prize will be deposited into your account. Thank you. So, so thank you, Raji. Maybe to the Young Scientist Award is Raji. No, both Walla and uh, Anbar yeah. have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Raji. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I request, I request uh, Dr. Chandra Ramarao to just uh, uh, present the award. I will share the citation so that you. Chandra, are you on call to say hello? And uh... <laughs> uh, yes, I am indeed. In case if you're wondering, um, <laughs> listen. Let me let me first start by thanking you. Um, yeah. So I'd like to extend um, uh, my thanks on behalf of the A.V. Ramarao Foundation to the director of ISCT, Dr. Chandrasekhar and Dr. Raji Reddy. Thanks so much for working behind the scenes. Um, you guys are extremely busy with all this COVID scenario. And uh, Chandra, I know you're on so many committees and juggling so many balls. Um, uh, thanks so much for ensuring everything does still happen on time. Um, very quickly, I'd like to thank the selection committee so this year it was Professor VK Singh who was the chairman of the selection committee. And um, we also had Professor Anunay Samantha and Professor Krishna Kaliyapan. Uh, thanks so much uh, for um, you know that very sort of healthy discussion we had. It's always tricky when you're making selections because there are so many factors you got to choose like originality, uh, applications, um, you know, where all this is going to extend. Uh, different fields of work and the different applications that come, but uh, it was done really very well and a big thanks to you all. And um, of course, finally, uh, my hearty congratulations uh, to these wonderful scientists who were selected. Uh, wishing you the very best and um, 
That's a very colorful citation you got there. Uh, Thank you much. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, good luck and uh, best wishes from all of us in the foundation here. <laughs> It's so nice to have you. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Dr. Chandra Bola and uh, Dr. Anbar Asan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Super. And um, thanks all for attending. I can still see there are 85 participants. And uh, Professor uh, Sandeep Verma, um, sorry, you're, you're on another uh, panel. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, thanks for your time. And uh, it's so good to meet with you virtually. Hopefully next year this time, we can all, we can all sort of like, you know, meet in this wonderful campus that ICT has and we can all sort of like be able to shake hands and you know enjoy a good lunch so yeah. until then <laughs> let's all try to stay safe uh, thanks again Chandra and Raji yeah thanks Chandra Amaro, and uh, thanks Raji for I think making a virtual presentation while I think a bouquet a memento <laughs> and all that went on well and uh, I request uh, Chandra Shekhar Malapaka to propose the word of thanks and virtual lunch also. Yeah. Virtual, I think you will Zomato will deliver the meal to you. <laughs> That's an idea for next time. Eh? <laughs> no, no, next time we are meeting physically, man. I think yeah, all let's do the next ten for another year. I think hopefully you're all getting vaccinated and we'll be on on track. I think so. Yeah, Malapaka. Yeah, it's my great privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this auspicious occasion of National Technology Day celebrations. At the outset, director and staff, I profusely thank Professor Sandeep Verma, Secretary of CRB, for delivering Dr. A.V. Ramar of Technology Award Lecture. I thank Avra Young Scientist Awardees, Dr. Chandra M.R. Walla and Dr. Ambarasan for presenting their outstanding research work. I thank uh, Padma Bhushan, Dr. A.V. Ramarao, Former Director IACT, Founder uh, Avra Labs, and Dr. Chandra Ramarao, Chief Operating Officer of Avra Labs, for being with us on this occasion. I also thank all the members of CSR IACT family, including my colleagues, some of the directors, uh, CSR Lab directors, former uh, staff members, students, media friends, and all uh, other participants witnessing the live event on various social uh, media platforms. I thank IT team and other support staff of IACT responsible for making this live event happen with a grand success. Finally, I thank Manandal and request you to join for recitation of Jatiya Githam. Thank you very much. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Puttala, Vanga, Vindya, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchala, Jaladhi, Taranga, Dava, Shubha, Name, Jage, Dava, Shubha, Ashish, Mage, Dahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangana Dayaka Jaya He Bharata Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He you all and hope to see you soon physically very soon and uh, stay safe god bless all of us thank you bye bye thank you thank you, thank you very much bye. bye thank you sir thank you